Namaskar and welcome to Diplomatic Dispatch with me, your host, Vikas Swaroop. As the President of the Arab Republic of Egypt, His Excellency Mr. Abdul Fattah El Sisi pays a state visit to India and is accorded the honor of being the chief guest at our 74th Republic Day. We take a deep dive into India's long standing and multifaceted ties with Egypt. India and Egypt are two of the world's most ancient civilizations, with economic and cultural exchanges dating back to time immemorial. Emperor Ashoka's edicts refer to his kingdom's relations with Egypt under Pharaoh Ptolemy II. In modern times, the struggle against colonialism and foreign domination fostered empathy between Indian and Egyptian nationalists. After independence, both India and Egypt came together to promote the goal of Afro-Asian solidarity, out of which was born the Non-Aligned Movement, led by India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and Egypt's second President Gamal Abdel Nasser. India supported Egypt during the international crisis over the ownership and operation of the Suez Canal in 1956, and the two countries even contemplated nuclear cooperation and a joint fighter aircraft project in the 1960s. Then came a long lull in the relationship during the presidencies of Anwar Sadat and Hosni Mubarak. It was under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi and President El Sisi that India-Egypt ties regained momentum, marked by a shared commitment to foster economic growth, collaboration in the fields of defence and security, and convergence on regional and global issues. President El Sisi visited India in October 2015 to participate in the third India-Africa Forum Summit and in September 2016 on a state visit. More recently, Defence Minister Rajnath Singh and External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar visited Egypt in September and October 2022 respectively. The signing of an MOU on defence cooperation during the Defence Minister's visit to Cairo was a particularly significant development, with both sides agreeing to focus on joint training, defence co-production and equipment maintenance. The first ever joint exercise between the special forces of the Indian Army and the Egyptian Army, named Exercise Cyclone 1, is in progress at Jaisalmer in Rajasthan since the 14th of January. Nine Indian naval ships have made port calls in Egypt in the last 18 months. The Egyptians have also shown some interest in India's Tejas fighter jets and Dhruv light attack helicopters. Counterterrorism is also an area of mutual interest given that President LCC has had to resolutely battle a host of terrorist groups aligned with ISIS, Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood. The two national security councils are working closely, as is the Joint Working Group on Counter-Terrorism. Bilateral trade has grown by almost 75% last year to touch $7.26 billion. More than 50 Indian companies have invested around $3.15 billion in diverse sectors of Egyptian economy, such as chemicals, pharma, energy, textile, garment, agribusiness, IT and retail. In April 2022, Egypt approved India as a certified wheat supplier, putting an end to a long-standing non-tariff barrier. Significant progress has also been made in recent months in the realm of green energy, with the Egyptian government signing MOUs with a number of Indian companies, including Gurugram-based Renew Power, which will set up a green hydrogen plant in the Suez Canal economic zone with an investment of $8 billion. So what makes the India-Egypt partnership so special? To discuss this, I have with me an outstanding expert. Ambassador Navdeep Suri is a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. He spent a large part of his 36 years in the Indian Foreign Service in the Middle East, including as ambassador to UAE and Egypt. He also served as High Commissioner to Australia. Welcome back to the show, Ambassador Suri. A pleasure to be back. Now, India under Prime Minister Modi has made a concerted outreach to Egypt. What makes Egypt such a pivotal player in the region and beyond? Well, you know, I had the privilege of serving twice in Egypt. So once as a young uh, IFS probationer who learned Arabic language in, in, in Cairo and then back as ambassador 21 years later. In Egypt, um, they call themselves Umma Dunya, which is mother of the word. 
And that's because of the civilizational history. I think if you, when you look at the real ancient civilizations of the world, you look at Egypt, you look at Mesopotamia, you look at Indus Valley. Uh, these are the ones that 2,500 years BC uh, were still uh, thriving. Uh, so there's that sense that this is a really old, ancient country with a very rich civilizational uh, culture. The second is its geography. Uh, Egypt straddles Asia and Africa. Um, the Sinai Peninsula is on the, uh, on the Asian side, and the rest of uh, is, uh, the mainland Egypt is on the African side. And the Suez Canal bisects that and, and connects uh, the Red Sea with the Mediterranean. The third aspect, uh, apart from geography, is the way Egypt has leveraged its geography uh, to forge trade links uh, and free trade agreements with Europe, with the, the rest of the African continent, with the Arab world, and, and, and so on. And finally, I would say that as the seat of the League of Arab States, uh, which are headquartered in Egypt, and typically the Secretary General of the League of Arab States is a former Egyptian foreign minister or a senior uh, Egyptian diplomat, Egypt also gets an additional clout uh, in the Arab world. And if that were not all, you come to the Islamic perspective, um, Cairo was the center of the uh, Islamic empire, it was the seat of the caliphate for a few hundred years. Uh, even today, it is home to Al-Azhar, which is the uh, most revered seat of uh, learning in the Islamic world, uh, and really, in a sense, a center of jurisprudence uh, uh, for Islam. So for all of those reasons, uh, I think Egypt uh, has always been and will continue to remain a pivotal country. Now, in 1979, Egypt became the first Arab country to sign a peace treaty with Israel following the Camp David Accords. How did that change the geopolitical map of the region? You know, there used to be a saying uh, in those days that you can't have war without Egypt and you can't have peace without Syria. Uh, and uh, what the Camp David Accord uh, meant uh, was that there's been no further war between Israel and the uh, Arab nations. You had skirmishes in Gaza and uh, Lebanon and elsewhere, but you haven't had the kind of full-scale wars, uh, the last of which was in 1973. Uh, so uh, I, I think the fact of Camp David is it's held the peace, in a manner of speaking, in the, in the region. I would say that if you look at it in more contemporary terms, the Abraham Accords were a, another similar mm -hmm. moment where they normalized relations between Israel and uh, uh, UAE, uh, Bahrain, and Sudan, and Morocco. So you can see that some degree of uh, normalization of ties between Israel uh, and some of the Arab states has come uh, into being. And the Camp David Accord that Egypt uh, uh, signed uh, in, in the US uh, in 1979 was a trendsetter. I have to say that Egypt, at that time, paid a price for it. It was ostracized by a number of developing countries, a number of Arab countries. It was suspended from the League of Arab States, even though the League was uh, headquartered. headquartered. In fact, it temporarily moved to Tunis uh, during that period. But again, you really can't conceive an Arab world without Egypt. And so Egypt held firm, and then the rest fell into place. Now, we all remember the time when a container ship blocked the Suez Canal for six days in March 2021 and all but halted a major portion of global trade. So what makes the Suez Canal so critical to global commerce? Well, uh, if you rewind history by about uh, 170 years or so, uh, before the Suez Canal was built in the 1860s, the only way to go from Asia uh, to Europe was around the Cape of Good Hope, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, which meant very treacherous seas around the Cape. A uh, lot of shipwrecks are still around to show you how dangerous that journey used to be. But also, it was a very long journey. What Suez Canal has done is it has enabled large ships to avoid going around the Cape. It's cut the distance. So it's really the shortest, fastest route for shipping uh, between uh, Asia and, and Europe. And, 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 and not just Europe, but even between Asia and the east coast of the United States. Uh, and... Uh, so no wonder that today something like 20% mm. of the world's container traffic transits through the Suez Canal. 18,000 ships a year uh, go through the Suez Canal. It is one of the 
most crucial arteries for a global uh, trade. And, and it was also a, a significant source of revenue for the Egyptians and a source of national pride as well. Uh, it's so important that in 1956, uh, a war was fought over the Suez Canal when the Egyptians uh, decided to uh, flex their muscle and uh, um, kind nationalize of, uh, it. Uh, and, and, not, and they nationalized it. And there was a, a joint Anglo-British uh, attempt with the Israelis to try and uh, uh, deny them that nationalization and capture the Suez Canal. That's how important it is. Now, China has made major inroads in Egypt with its Belt and Road Initiative. It held its first summit with Arab states in December in Riyadh. So how do you see China's footprint in the region? I think it's not just region. You see China's footprint everywhere, and that's a reality uh, that we deal with. Uh, but it's a reality that has profound implications uh, for us and for many other countries in the world, as we are uh, seeing increasingly uh, that the Chinese footprint is not benign. Uh, and uh, uh, its economic interventions are often accompanied by political strings. For us, I think the concern is not that the Belt and Road Initiative expands into the Sinai Peninsula or into the Suez Canal area, uh, but the strategic leverage that it could potentially give to the Chinese, particularly at a time when the Egyptian economy has been uh, struggling a bit. So I, I, I feel that the real issue for us is to um, make efforts ourselves. From the Egyptian perspective, they need in Chinese investment, they need infrastructure. But if others don't invest, then they become even more dependent upon the Chinese. And, and so I feel that for us uh, today, it is both an economic and a strategic imperative to have a whole of government approach where government and industry join hands to take advantage of some of the opportunities that Egypt offers and not leave the playing field entirely to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Now, turning to bilateral ties, after the 1960s, India-Egypt relations were in a bit of a freeze till those two visits to India by President El Sisi. And now, of course, he's the chief guest at our Republic Day. So what changed to take India-Egypt relations to this new phase? I think one is clearly that Prime Minister Modi has invested an enormous amount of energy into our foreign relations. He has visited a lot of countries personally. Egypt is a country that he hasn't yet visited. He was supposed to visit uh, uh, last year but COVID came in the way and the visit had to be deferred. But meanwhile, I think both sides have shown sincere intent uh, to uh, impart a new momentum to this relationship. Uh, we've seen it not just in President Sisi's visits, but a host of ministerial and other visits from the Egyptian side. From our side, we've had both our Raksha Mantri and the External Affairs Minister go in quick succession in September and October um, last year. And in a sense, paved the way for the invitation to President Sisi to be the uh, chief guest on our Republic Day. So I really think that uh, uh, this is a great way to kickstart uh, a relationship that we've generally said is below potential. We've always spoken about the immense potential of the relationship. We've harked on the nostalgia of the relationship. Uh, but I hope that uh, this visit uh, has really succeeded in imparting the momentum that it needed. Now, Egypt is militarily the most powerful country in the Arab world. India-Egypt defense cooperation is now picking up pace. What, according to you, are its main pillars? And how do you see the future of this partnership on the defense side evolving? Well, you know, personally, at a broader level, I think it's a good thing that India has started doing a lot of exercises with like-minded countries. And I'm happy that uh, it is not just the US or Australia or UAE. Uh, that comes into that category of Japan. But uh, Egypt also is now coming into that category where you see a convergence of strategic interests uh, and, and you feel sufficiently comfortable with each other to do some fairly sophisticated exercises. Uh, our um, uh, air forces, when they exercised, it really meant sending our aircraft into Egypt uh, for uh, a considerable time. Uh, and now for the special forces to be doing similar exercises again uh, shows a level of trust. I think as we go forward, there's a recognition that we use similar platforms, whether it's the Mirage or the Rafales from uh, France or the uh, MiG from the uh, uh, Russians. Um, there is a convergence of our uh, training doctrines at some levels. And um, I think it harks well, especially Egypt uh, is probably looking to diversify 
some of its sources of uh, weaponry. And, um, you know, we've had some initial conversations about the possibility of Egypt uh, looking at either uh, Dhruva light attack helicopters or potentially even the Tejas. So I think these are very positive signs for the future that uh, defense uh, establishments of the two countries, both at the ministerial and at the army chief level, uh, have been talking to each other. Now, trade has touched $7.26 billion, which is a record. But as you have just said, it is still below the potential. Which are the sectors where you think India and Egypt can make quick progress? I think uh, pharmaceuticals is a key area. Um, our light engineering goods uh, is a very uh, important area. Uh, automobiles, which we now increasingly are small cars are exported around the world. Our Bajaj two-wheelers are ubiquitous in, in, in Cairo. You, you already see them in very large numbers. Mm -hmm. But I think as we transition towards electric vehicles, uh, both two-wheelers, three-wheelers, and then four-wheelers, you will see a large market for them. So I would say that Indian companies who are getting into the EV uh, game in a big way should certainly look at a, at, at a margin um, a market like Egypt. I would also say that the, there's a lot of untapped potential in services, not just goods. Mm -hmm. um, our IT uh, companies, for example, they do a lot of work in, for US and for Europe, but they really haven't made any serious effort to enter into the large Egyptian uh, market. Um, our digital public infrastructure that we have developed, I think that has a natural resonance because Egypt, again, is a country in many ways similar uh, to ours. So for all of those reasons, but I would add one additional one. I think uh, there's that old adage that does trade follow investment or investment mm -hmm. follow trade, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think if Indian companies start investing into Egypt, um, let me give you one example that there's a company from Chennai, uh, TCI Sanmar, or the Sanmar Group, that has a $1.5 billion plant uh, in uh, Port Said in Egypt. And already from that plant, something like 70% of their output is exported. Mm -hmm. So you can see how uh, uh, investments then can add to uh, trade. Now, speaking of investment, the ambitious plans to develop the 455 square kilometer Suez Canal economic zone into a global manufacturing hub are now gathering critical mass. Can that become the new hub for Indian investment in the region? It holds a lot of promise for us. And, uh, you know, if in this case, we look closely at what the Chinese have done, uh, they've taken a 7.3 square kilometer enclave and... Uh, uh, the the Tera Suez. Yes, the Tera Suez. And they are trying to uh, encourage uh, Chinese companies to set up. And some 80, 85 Chinese companies have already established uh, operations over there. And I believe they have invested about a billion dollars. They, those companies have invested about a billion dollars and see what it does. It, it, it not only feeds the Egyptian market, but it gives them an export hub mm -hmm. out of uh, Suez uh, with an ability to export to uh, Europe and to Africa at much lower uh, cost. I think India needs to look at that. Uh, we've seen some isolated cases. I mentioned to you uh, the TCI Sanmar, which are in Port Said. Uh, Renew has recently signed up uh, an $8 billion project. They've done the MOU with the, the Egyptians to set up a very large uh, hy green hydrogen facility. But if we are to see a convergence of geoeconomics with geopolitics, then I think we should find a way to approach the Egyptian side and acquire a chunk of land on lease where a cluster of Indian companies can come. And I think that would be one important way to, uh, to uh, take this forward. I understand that some very useful conversations have taken place on this during President Sisi's visit. So I uh, hope that this is uh, going to uh, go forward. And the Egyptians are also offering some incentives now for companies to come in and set up. Uh, there are some very attractive tax incentives available, uh, the incentives on infrastructure. The land itself is available at very attractive prices. And, you know, for companies, especially the ones that are venturing into uh, green hydrogen, of course, there's 365 days of sun in the, in, in the Sinai uh, Peninsula. So, you know, really our cost of generating solar power comes down uh, significantly. Mm -hmm. But they've also gone a step further and uh, created eight clusters or platforms uh, for which they are seeking investment. And I think Indian companies and particularly our business associations, whether it's CII or FICI or SHM, would do well to study those and then motivate our companies to look at this as, uh, as a very forward-looking investment opportunity. Now, why have agriculture and food security emerged as an important area for the bilateral partnership? I think the Russia-Ukraine war has something to do with it. 
The Russia-Ukraine war has a lot to do with it because Egypt uh, is the world's largest importer of wheat. Uh, world's largest importer? It, it is the world's largest importer of wheat. And uh, uh, the uh, blockages that happened in the Black Sea uh, post the Ukraine war came as a shock because Ukraine and Russia were also its two largest sources of wheat. And so there was suddenly a scramble. When you want to understand food security or food insecurity, uh, it is the notion uh, or the realization that the next ship carrying food grains may not arrive because it can't uh, leave the Black Sea. And that's when these conversations started uh, uh, in, in all earnestness. And Egypt has, in fact, uh, then sent a team to India. They've gone to Madhya Pradesh and some of other wheat uh, growing areas to include India in the list mm -hmm. of countries uh, from which it can uh, import wheat. But I think export-import is only one side of the game. If I look deeper at it, Egypt is increasingly a water-scarce country. Um, it's a very interesting geography in the sense that for 110 million people, 90% live in 4% of the country's area. So the Nile Valley, which has always been the breadbasket, is today under stress. Uh, and, and, and we need to have these discussions, not just on trade, but also on technology. Uh, we see adverse climate conditions building. How do we do climate smart agriculture? How do we shift to uh, crops that are more disaster resilient uh, so that we are ready for the uncertain future that uh, is coming towards us? Now, how do you see the potential of energy cooperation, given the recent discovery of a huge gas field in the eastern Mediterranean? I would uh, be a bit cautious on that for the simple reason that, again, Ukraine-Russia conflict uh, and the impact that it has had on gas supplies in Europe. So what is happening is that the two large discoveries in the Mediterranean have been in Israel and in Egypt. Uh, and uh, Israel did not have a ready means to export to Europe. So Israel is using a, a northern Mediterranean pipeline to send its gas to Egypt. And Egypt is exporting its own gas to, uh, uh, to Europe. Uh, and, and my sense is that for the next few years, Egypt is unlikely to have exportable surpluses for India or other countries in our part of the world because the Europeans are in a position to bear, pay a better price and they are much closer in terms of the logistics. So I think even though Egypt has become a net exporter of gas, uh, its uh, ability at this point to, uh, uh, to look at India is limited. You might see, as I mentioned earlier, much more scope in uh, new areas like green hydrogen, where Indian companies are really looking at the incentives that Egypt is offering, um, abundant desert land uh, and decent infrastructure, and the ability to set up a green hydrogen facility that, that can export to Europe. Yeah. Now, Egypt has also been invited as a guest country during India's G20 presidency. As we seek to address the concerns of the Global South, and Egypt and India, of course, belong to the Global South, how can the two countries work together? Well, I think this is a really back to the future kind of uh, situation where we were both the stalwarts of the non-aligned movement. Uh, and we were the voice of the Global South during the uh, difficult times of the Cold War. And, and, and I think it, there's a need to recapture uh, some of that uh, momentum. Both of us have a significant amount of goodwill in the Global South. And I think the opportunity uh, here is that can we complement each other's voice on issues that matter to the Global South, from food security to climate change to data privacy to everything else, uh, and, and amplify that voice in the Global North. Then we would really together be serving the purpose of uh, a good part of humanity. In fact, Egypt also hosted the COP27 uh, meet in Sharm el-Sheikh. It, 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 it did. And uh, for the first time, the acknowledgement that loss and damage is an issue that needs to be addressed, that the uh, poorest countries of the global south have suffered loss and damage for no fault of theirs, only as a result of emissions caused by the north, uh, is something that has been acknowledged. And whether how it gets put into practice in COP28 and beyond is something to be seen. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Suri, for those incredibly uh, generous insights. A complex geopolitical environment, new regional dynamics, and shared interests have brought India and Egypt closer again. As the two countries mark the 75th anniversary of their diplomatic ties, the presence of the Egyptian president 
as the chief guest at our Republic Day represents India's outreach to Africa and the Arab world and provides opportunities for both countries to rekindle their historical friendship and scale up their relations as strategic partners. That is all I have for you in this edition of Diplomatic Dispatch. Thanks for watching. Take care and goodbye.